Uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Josh Human, and I'm the curator of education and public programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery uh, here in Toronto at Harborfront Centre. I am so thrilled and delighted to um, welcome you this evening. This is our first collaboration ever with Pride Toronto, and really my heart swells and bursts um, with joy over this. Um, it's really a dream come true. Uh, I was born and raised here in Toronto. I went to the Pride Parade in my younger years, uh, brought my husband to the Pride Parade when we finally uh, were together. Um, and so I'm delighted to participate now uh, in a programming capacity. Uh, at Pride, I really want to extend special thanks to uh, Brandon, to Danny, to Laura, um, who have worked really hard to make this all happen. Uh, of course, my extreme gratitude to all the artists who are here with us this evening. Uh, and for those of you who may have uh, challenges with your audio, uh, we do have ASL interpretation. Um, so the genesis of this program is uh, playing off of a presentation format uh, that some of you are familiar with, where artists show, or people, speakers show, 20 images for 20 seconds each, which is like a roller coaster ride. It's very challenging and it's a little overwhelming for both the presenters and for the speakers. So we've slowed it down just a little bit. Um, so in some cases, you'll be hearing from artists who are showing several images, but not too, too many. Uh, and from one or two artists, uh, you may not see any images because they're really focusing on the ideas with which they grapple. Um, but I felt it was really important during Pride to bring art in a fine art sense um, to the table uh, we have incredibly talented artists, uh, brilliant thinkers uh, who produce visual art objects and experiences that go in galleries, uh, are installed in sometimes very unexpected spaces, um, and sometimes they are performative, so they're not necessarily making objects at all. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to uh, jump right in uh, to our first artist, uh, born in Nairobi, Kenya, an internationally recognized Canadian artist working at the intersection of dance and visual arts. He's currently based out of Chicago uh, and his projects address issues of race, queer culture, migration, protest, and other forms of collective movement. So please welcome to your screen, Brandon Fernandez. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Josh, for that really uh, generous uh, introduction. And thank you for including me in this program. And thank you to Pride Toronto. Um, you know, I grew up in Toronto um, uh, when my family moved from Kenya to Canada. And so Toronto is a very special place for me and it still is a home. Uh, and in a lot of my work, I think a lot about ideas of where is home. And I've lived in many different places. Um, and I think part of home is the idea of community and building community spaces. And that's partially what my art's about. I work through the intersection of dance and visual arts, as you mentioned. And for me, I use dance as a medium to be political. Dance, 
classically trained ballet dancer, trained in Toronto, um, also trained as a modern dancer, but I think about dance as a way to bring people together. So I'm gonna show a couple of, of works. Um, I'll go kind of fast through them and share the screen. Um, uh, okay, I'm having a bit of a moment here. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. So I'm gonna show a quick presentation of my work. Um, and I think a lot about my work through queer spaces, you know, queering as a space of inclusivity, queering as a space of gathering, social solidarity. And when I bring people together to dance, not necessarily just like in a formal way as a ballet dancer or a modern dancer, but also through the club space, I think a lot of, when I lived in New York for the last 16 years, how the club became a space for social solidarity, a space to, to be inclusive, a space where I could feel freedom and sanctuary. Um, and the dance floor became a very important place for me um, because also the dance floor as, um, as a formal dancer becomes this question of resistance, the way the body is moving on a, an architectural form, this flat surface that also penetrates and hits your body. And so I started to think a lot about that space uh, for me, Vogue culture, um, the space where querying could be really a, a moment to engage with each other. And so this is a piece called Freefall 49 that was based on Pulse Orlando when people um, you know, gathered in a nightclub to find freedom, to find sanctuary, but our sanctuary was infiltrated. We were, um, we were hurt, 49 people fell to the ground. So I always think about the notion of falling and I choreograph this notion of falling. Like how do I choreograph a fall that makes a body touch the ground, but also protect the, the ground. Um, and this, a lot of my work deals with these kind of gatherings of bringing people together. And in the end, we all dance. And so I make a lot of work based on these ideas of, of protection, who takes care of my body, who's looking after our bodies, who sees my body as being visible. And so a lot of my, my work thinks through these ideas. Um, I also think about, um, you know, specifically this piece on flashing lights was a piece that I did in Toronto in 2018, thinking about, again, visibility, who's taking care of my body, thinking about the queer community in Toronto and how the police and the queer community had, um, um, you know, um, like conflict, you know, and I think it's, it's okay to say that. And so I made this piece where we, we danced in Louis Blanche for a number of hours, but we danced to the lights of the police sirens. And I always question this idea of being invisible, but also being visible, political spaces. How do we also bring people into a space to gather, to be with each other? Um, and as you can see at this piece, we were sitting, standing in front of City Hall and we've had this mass, critical mass. So I think about it through social political spaces of gathering huge amounts of people. Um, and it's a form of protest in a way, you know, when we come together, we are, we are making a solidarity. I think our communities are fractured and we need to create communities and gatherings where we're not saying that your struggle is different than my struggle. We are all coming together to find a commonality, to find our civil rights, to fight for our civil rights. And so this is uh, part of Unflashing Lights. Um, I do a lot of work working with formal ballet dancers as well thinking about the technicalities of the bodies, the differences of our bodies, the questions of like um, separating bodies where a certain body is not allowed to be part of that. As a young ballet dancer, I was always told that I was too small, too brown, uh, too different. And so I question and I create agency for my dancers. My dancers are collaborators. So collaboration is a really important space in my work to work with each other, but to also say we self-identify and we make a space of empowerment for ourselves. And so within that, there's a generosity, there's a kindness, there's an inclusive space that we are all coming together in. Um, so this is a piece called Master and Form that was at the Whitney Museum this past year. Um, I also work with dancers to think through making questions of like, how do we gather and support each other through a choreography that's based on collaboration where I give them like motifs or tasks and then we work with each other um, to formalize these these notions of, of being the same. Um, I'll end on this piece. This is a piece called Freefall for Camera, which will debut in uh, hopefully next year at the AGO. 
uh, based on the idea of falling. I made a film to show that we, when we fall, we stand up again. And so we start to fall and make these motifs, these patterns, but it's about a falling body that is a vulnerable body, a one that will stand up again. So the political gesture of standing becomes a political gesture of moving forward. And I think right now in this, this space that we're in right now, we need to think about moving forward. The political futures, um, how do we make those? And that's the work that we have to do. Um, and it's really important and um, yeah, I will end there. Um, thank you, <laughs> getting emotional. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brendan. I know it's uh, it's a very tight presentation format, but we'll have a couple of questions at the end that, that will hopefully, you know, enrich uh, enrich our understanding of your work and how it relates, you know, in a much broader context. Um, so keeping things going, uh, next up is a multidisciplinary artist and educator currently based in Kijapuktuk. I believe that's the pronunciation. Halifax, Nova Scotia. Her practice activates public space outside of conventional gallery contexts through artist multiples, drawing, installation, performance, and community arts events. So I welcome to our screens, Anya Hogan Finley. Hi folks, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much for hosting. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Right on. Um, okay, I'm going to set a timer here so that we don't go over. Um, great. So my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm going to share some images tonight. Um, the first uh, work I'm going to speak about is a piece that connects me to the power plant. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about pandemic time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Almost there. All right, are we set? Yes, okay, cool. All right, so I want to acknowledge that um, today I'm calling in from the ancestral territory, uh, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and I'm grateful to be a visitor here. I'm originally from New Brunswick, and uh, prior to moving to, to Chibukta, Halifax, I was living in Southern California. So some of the work I'll be talking about relates to that move as well. Um, so, we're going to be talking about periods and pandemic. When I moved to Los Angeles, I was um, focused on uh, working and activating the archives at the, the One Archive. So initially, my research was looking at um, representations of lesbian content and printed ephemera. And um, then my, the, my critical eye kind of shifted to look at what was missing in the archives, namely representations of queers of color and trans folks. So I did a bunch of work uh, around those, those ideas and themes. And in part of my research, something that I came across was a box of calendars. And these were a box of calendars that had kind of accumulated and had not yet been, um, had not yet been sorted and, and cataloged by the archivists. So that, that discovery of these calendars inspired me to make a piece um, that was in response to an invitation um, by John Davies at the power plant. And it was for an exhibition called Coming After. And so the result of that was to create this calendar called Periods uh, 20 or 2020, or 2012, pardon me. And it was looking at um, the a specific kind of range of calendars created between 1984 and 2000 and, uh, well, it would have been 2011. And so it was really, um, you know, I, want, I was curious to see if the, the AIDS crisis and pandemic, if it influenced the kind of graphics and the kind of imagery that, um, that was found in these calendars. So these are calendars, some of them from um, LGBT organizations and some were um, calendars that were donated to the archives, maybe um, sexy firemen, these kinds of things. So it was quite a range of, of kinds of imagery. So that piece um, 
you know, looked at this idea of a repeating calendar year. So if you have a calendar from 1984, you could use that calendar in 2012. And I bring that up because something I've been thinking about a lot these days is this idea of um, looking back and looking forward. And so if we look back 28 years to a repeating calendar year, we look at 1992. And I was speaking earlier to, um, to my good friend Paige Gratlin and she was talking about the idea of how we engaged with uh, when we were teenagers in 92 with imagery of the, um, the uprisings, the riots happening in Los Angeles in response to the Rodney King um, verdict when that came out. Uh, being teenagers, kind of understanding what that was, and there's been a lot of screen time we've all been engaging in now uh, at home in this pandemic era, as well as in the streets. So the uh, other image that I've shared here is a, a healing walk that took place here honoring um, Chantal Moore. And this happened um, all across North America. And this was a walk that was in, in Halifax. So thinking kind of back, back and forth um, about what's changed, you know, the same battles that we're still fighting these years later. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of hearken then this idea of uh, forward thinking and looking forward to 20, 2048. So that'll be the next repeating calendar year. Where will we be then? Much of my time since moving here in Halifax and time during pandemic has been spent um, educating myself and, and doing research about what this place is and my kind of role in this place. Uh, my background is uh, white settler ancestry, Irish Canadian, and so what it kind of means to be here, take up space here in this place. So these are just a few um, kind of books, podcasts, and some films that I've been looking at, some specifically from that kind of 19, early 90s era and, and contemporary things as well. And um, so um, what I'm calling instant messaging. So initially in those first days of staying home in the pandemic, um, uh, something that I ended up doing and, and we inspired uh, the, my neighbors here, we inspired each other to post messages to residents and frontline staff living in the North Care um, uh, facility that uh, my apartment faces out onto in Halifax. So for a time, the, the um, Northwood care facility was the epicenter of the pandemic here in Halifax. So we posted messages to, to each other back and forth. And prior to using the windows in that way, um, the room in my apartment, I had been, I had kind of transformed into a camera obscura. So this segues into work that I'm doing now that is um, supported by the Canada Council. Thank you, Canada Council. Um, it is work that is going to culminate in the creation of a public art sculpture that is a camera obscura. So a camera obscura, when you're inside such a, a, a space, the outside world is projected upside down. So I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the world being turned upside down and how we orient ourselves uh, when everything seems kind of unfamiliar and when, you know, in this kind of untenable moment. So I just have an image here of the lens that's used to kind of um, uh, give an example of how a camera obscura can be made. And so uh, in moving in moving from Southern California, I was based for about a de decade in Los Angeles to, um, to Nova Scotia. My work follows me and that's something that my dear friend Logan McDonald kind of says all the time and something that I really take to heart. So initially the project I had proposed was looking at um, the, the impact of orange orchards in Southern California and so now the work is shifting to look at um, the role of settler colonial um, uh, folks who landed in Nova Scotia and established apple orchards. So now I'm looking at these kind of parallel lines of settler colonialism, both in California and in Nova Scotia through apples and oranges. So kind of looking at the history of colonization through um, the introduction really of these two fruits. And then of course, um, migration, labor, um, uh, distribution of all of these things are related as well as the rail. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. So I'm going to end there. Let's see, I had one last slide. It doesn't seem to be coming up. No sweat, but I will end by saying that by 2048, um, goddess willing, we will have a few things sorted out. Some of these things I hope will include reparations, including landmark reparations and apologies issued to survivors of residential schools uh, folks who were forced to live in internment camps, generations who've been impta impacted by slavery, de-escalation training and culturally responsive pedagogies as common practice in all levels of education and healthcare, restorative justice, replacing mass incarceration, abolishment of the police, civil rights that have been won by marginalized people, 
for, for everyone to keep those and for them not to be threatened with each new administration in power. And finally, for queers to be able to enjoy the privileges and rights of folks in the mainstream, but for queers to stay weird. So that is what I hope for our, our looking forward for the next um, 28 years of repeating calendar year. So stop screen sharing. Let's see, did we do it? Are we good? Good. Awesome. Well, thank you, Anya. That was a, that was a sprint to the finish, but really such a, an amazing story. Um, you, like Brandon, sort of, you know, Canadian or here in Canada at some stage, going abroad, uh, in your case, coming back. Um, I understand because I move off, moved off to the U.S. for 16 years and moved back and came back to a very different Toronto um, from 1980, from 1999 to 2016. So I, I understand entirely. Uh, so moving on to our next uh, artist, a media maestro making art for site-specific spaces and screens of all sizes throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. He is known for pioneering early visual and media art in Canada, founding artist-run groups and organizing events, festivals, conferences, public interventions, uh, is now serving as uh, artistic director of Pride in Chinatown in Vancouver. Uh, please welcome to our screens, Paul Wong. Thank you. Hello to everybody and thanks for, um, have I un unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I'm here in Vancouver, Chinatown. Um, welcome to the unceded territories of the Musqueam Sailor Tooth um, and Squamish peoples. Um, um, I know many of you, I've seen many of your works and some of you I'm, I'm meeting for the first time. So it's, it's, it's great to be sharing screen time um, with you all. Um, just click off this other screen. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, pandemic. Um, you know, I've, um, behind me um, are these panels, which um, are several works that I have uh, made um, recently based on um, 900 um, letters that um, I discovered after my mother's death. 900 letters that were primarily um, written to her by friends, foes, um, comrade, committee members, uncles, aunts, uh, uh, brothers and sisters um, from southern China. Um, probably written from the late 1940s, really up to um, 212. Um, my mother passed on in 217. And these are the letters I described, I discovered um, um, in her private rooms. Um, these are all letters written to her. I can't read or write. Um, so this is about loss of language, loss of, 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 of history. So um, I've been able to get a number of these letters translated and they have become a very unique source of um, an extraordinary history. And um, I often treat these letters like I found them in an attic in Chinatown. I have tried to remove myself, um, sometimes to work this kind of material objectively and, and, and try to figure out um, who these letters were, were, were sent to. Um, of course, I have the subtext that's actually my mother and that I know a lot of these writers. Um, and many of these writers are actually still alive. And um, um, I wanted to return some of these letters to them uh, in Southern China. And the opportunity kind of suddenly arose in late December. And I found myself um, going back to Southern China, um, January the 10th, very well aware that there was um, this virus happening, um, which I've certainly kept track of. Um, I ended up coming back early. Uh, once uh, Wuhan shut down the city of 11 million people and the province of 40 million people, I got the hint that maybe I better end my trip 
and I better get to the closest airport and get home, which I did, which was uh, the end of January. And then I ended up quarantining um, and isolating for 14 days, um, certainly to kind of keep myself and the community safe, but also, you know, didn't really want to be the, Ch the old Chinese guy coming back from a trip in China, walking around wearing a mask. Um, and then he here we are a um, couple of months later and we get, um, you know, the idea of returning these letters to its senders and the call to visit, go back with three generations of family members uh, um, seemed like an incredible opportunity to go and celebrate, reconnect, um, because I can only understand the language in that specific small county that my parents came from, which is twice San Huiping, which were of um, the Western world's Chinatowns. Most of us came out of there through the Pearl River Delta and occupied the, the Philadelphia, the Chicago, the Toronto, the Vancouver, the San Francisco, the, the British colony Chinatowns. Um, so only in that area can I understand the language fluently. So the idea of going home seemed very attractive. Then this idea of getting home as quickly as possible seemed very urgent. And the notion of coming home to Vancouver, Canada, to my own home, I thought meant a level of safety and comfort. Come mid-December, you know, Trudeau is telling everyone to come home from abroad. And we begin our lockdowns here. So I'm saying the, um, so this has been such a major part of me for the last seven months. And, um, um, you know, I don't like the term new normal. Um, 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 and how this has affected my work, because um, I've also been working on a book. And having made that return trip to China, which I didn't want to do to finish the book, because I didn't really want to have that um, affect the way that I was reading these letters from, from an outsider point of view and not having that connection. But obviously that has shifted. And obviously everything else that's happened ha has shifted um, in terms of, of this notion of um, where we settle and, and, and what that means. And again, of course, also with language because you know i went uh, in, in, into china with a new phone stripped of all my apps but i did have vpn which actually allowed me to access a number of my uh, new english news sources so that because i don't understand mandarin so i don't understand radio or television um so so um my keeping informed of the impeding virus um, has always been this negotiation between um, language and access to language. And of course, this um, affects the way that I have been working with the translations and the reading um, of, 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 of all these letters, which are in Chinese. Now, the other project I'm working on um, is also work as a, uh, is Pride in Chinatown it's a festival that I've been doing in Chinatown for the last two years, which was the first time um, that there has been a, a queer presence in Chinatown. And I've been trying to facilitate what a queer Pan-Asian aesthetics might be. Um, and this year, of course, um, I can't do this new festival that we've been doing as an alternative to mainstream West Side being put into Chinatown. So right now I've just finished um, um, selecting a, a number of artists who are going to do site-specific works on hoardings, doorways, windows, shop windows that would invite people to come and engage these works throughout Chinatown. So, you know, pivot, 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 but it's a way of being able to actually claim now all these different areas in Chinatown and to invite artists to do interesting works 
and to invite um, viewers to come down social distance time to spread out and um, find these works in Chinatown. So that's where I'm at right now. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love that idea of of, uh, of coming home and all these different layers of meaning of what home can mean to each of us in different ways, different times of our lives, uh, certainly different contexts. Um, that's really- And I just, just finished by saying that um, to come home and, and also what's happened, you know, Chinatown for the first time has felt unsafe. So Chinatown as a place of community as a place for Chinese and Asians and others through this, this pandemic, through horrendous acts of discrimination and racism and violence um, is unsafe. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't addressing it at the beginning because I figured we'd grapple with, with that at, at the end or in one of my questions. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, we're, we're, we find ourselves in a time uh, of uh, anti-black racism uh, triggered by events in the United States, but we know that Canada is steeped in systemic racism. Uh, as Anya mentions, um, anti-indigenous um, acts and and uh, are all a daily occurrence, it seems. Um, and so that is equally disturbing. And then as LGBTQ plus community, um, we are victims of hate crimes, which is another form of systemic racism. We rank along with uh, the Jewish community in Canada, with the Muslim community in Canada, uh, with those uh, who are uh, mentally or physically disabled, um, refugee status, um, and so on. It's, it's really um, it, it, some days it feels like, like everything is like on fire. Um, and I think that's sort of the heart of, of, uh, an aspect of today's program is to consider, you know, what, what we've been working on during this COVID pandemic, um, and what we, what we hope for in the future. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely return to this, um, after everyone's presented with one of my questions. Um, uh, so let's move on to our next uh, artist, uh, an artist of Michif and mixed European descent, uh, situated within personal and political contexts. Their art practice and research are grounded in queer, feminist, and indigenous worldviews. Um, they're striving to elicit a sense of social and ecological responsibility and intimacy on a damaged planet. Um, so please welcome to our screens, Sherry Osden Nolt. Oh, you're muted. I'm having a little bit of lag on this end. Okay, cool, not too, too bad. Um, just a second, sorry about that. Zoom is trying to give me a menu like I haven't already been logged into a meeting and I'm not sure why. Um, okay. Hopefully any second now. I really don't know why Zoom's being upset with me. Okay, great. Great. I can see everything. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I don't believe I noted that there was a land acknowledgement for us here in Toronto, which of course is where the power plant is located and some of the other presenters. Uh, so I will maybe take a moment and do that. And I'm also going to bring up my share screen now. Um, hmm. What is happening? We totally check this all out. I don't know why technology is being so difficult now.
I'm really sorry. I'm just not getting an, uh, there we go, an option for Keynote to share screen. I've got it now. Okay. Um, so I wanted to say that I'm in Toronto, which is traditionally known as a meeting place. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, and it's governed under the Dish with One, Sp one Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, um, which precedes colonial treaties on this land and talks about sharing the land and engaging with each other on it in a way that's not only interested in the communal care of the land, but uh, the communal care of each other. And I think that that's something that's really important and significant about this place. Um, and I'm just going to kind of jump in from there. Um, so I wanted to set a bit of context about how coming in to um, the COVID-19 pandemic had looked for me because it's actually at the end of um, an extended period of uh, chronic illness. So I've been kind of engaged to, uh, able to engage with my practice only somewhat inconsistently over the last few years. And I've actually been more well than I had been in a while since um, about January. Uh, however, coming into January, we um, were dealing with a lot in the world. I know it seems for a lot of people like things really started changing when the pandemic hit um, and that there's been political uprising since then, but in Canada, there was a lot going on prior to then. Um, so January was hitting. I remember telling my therapist that like my life felt stable and I almost didn't even know what to do about that. Like I was, what do you do with stability? But then um, the RCMP started invading Wet'suwet'en and I was like, oh, okay, great. Everything feels unstable again. Good, this is what I'm used to, I guess. Uh, so I um, was dealing with kind of emotionally processing what was happening with land defenders, uh, trying to support rail blockades. And then COVID-19 hit and in the continuation of the sort of social revolutionary actions that we were seeing early this year, um, there's a lot going on right now that's really important too. Within my art practice, um, politics and kind of accessible forms of art as well as um, more fine art pieces like sculptures are all really important to me. One of the things I've been doing for years is creating t-shirts and zines. And I decided in response to what was happening in Wet'suwet'en to create t-shirts from which all of the funds uh, went to land defenders in uh, Wet'suwet'en and other places across Canada. And I didn't fully comprehend how much labor that was going to work out to. So I wound up getting the t-shirt stock right after COVID-19 hit. And in a lot of ways, I was really lucky that I wasn't able to go to my day job because I had to spend so much time getting over a hundred t-shirts ready to ship to people. Um, I also took some of that time to do some experimenting and wrote a small uh, info zine on settler colonialism that tried to talk about it in a way that's considerate both indigenous and black peoples who were very affected by that here on Turtle Island and um, had a few friends from both of those communities look over it for me so that I could try to make sure that I, in my own ignorance as a pale like indigenous person who's only from a specific community, wouldn't uh, say something that would be offensive as well. And so writing that zine, um, figuring out how to make it so it was accessible for free on the internet and shipping all those shirts was my early, like completely time consuming pandemic life. Um, another thing that's been, and I'm really focusing on like what's been kind of different for me with the pandemic. Another thing that's been really amazing is um, the way that I tend to gather within my art practice. So this is just an image of a sculpture um, from a few years ago in the Art Gallery of Alberta, but it exemplifies a bit of the gathering that I do. So there's this piece of wood there, there's some fur kind of sticking out of it, there's um, plaster cast in my hand, a mink tail, some beads. I'm always looking for different materials and things that I can bring into my practice that I can then kind of build upon or alter or communicate with in a sort of physical way to say something that talks about um, the interconnected aspects of like, 
nature and humans and technology and the lives we're all living and there's something I think sort of inherently political in that but it is kind of the underpinnings more than the entire point um and another sort of gathering has been having the time to focus on growing some medicines things like um I have tobacco you can see in this photo I took it today I have two tobacco plants that are doing really well and I have a bunch of new sprouts because I killed all of my sprouts but two in the first round because it turns out tobacco is not the easiest to grow if you're me. And um, a further sort of gathering aspect of my practice is that these tobacco leaves, uh, while I do intend to use some of them for ceremony, may also make their way into sculptures um, or even growing them may make its way into future sculptures. And so it's a kind of very like grounded um, home and internal looking uh, point in time for me with uh, the, the freedom I've had to work a little bit less. And um, that's meant learning new skills and kind of trying to find how I can get a greater depth uh, into my practice that I might not have had the time for prior to this. I also now being in greater health have been able to return to some projects that were really significant to me that I was working on um, sort of prior to finding out that I was still quite ill last summer. And so these are some bronze casts of my own uh, leather fetish collar that I made at the BAMP Center last year. And it had been my intention to sort of augment them and add to them and make them these sort of unwearable, but like spiritual objects, speaking to both sexuality and spirituality. And I've had time to return to beading, which you can see um, is sort of just stuck alongside the piece that it's in relation with there and trying to become better in those skills. I've been looking at a lot of different bead workers uh, work and how they're doing things with a kind of time that I didn't get to commit before. Uh, so this is a bandana. Similarly, I've been working on a bandana project that I uh, was able to return to. I want to bead the entire thing, which is a bit ambitious, but looking both at how as indigenous folks, we often flag with our kind of beaded earrings or medallions or certain things that we'll wear, certain ways that we'll talk to each other, introduce each other, and then thinking also about flagging in the queer community. Um, and that's really rooted in things that kind of fill my time in a lighter hearted way. So this image shows um, a pine needle basket, which I had been taught to weave last year by um, a woman who I don't think considers herself an elder, but in many ways was uh, in the skills that she was imparting and then also making earrings. Uh, so enhancing skills that will go into future sculptures has been a really great aspect of this time because these things require so much time and care. And uh, this is just an example of somewhere that beading showed up much earlier in my practice. And with um, that kind of concluding things I've been working on, thinking about what I'm hoping for in the future, uh, the image I've chosen here represents a piece that I was supposed to have in the Winnipeg Art Gallery this summer. That's now in 2022. And we really have this different skew of what the future is based on all of the kind of changes that we've had to make. I hope that we can continue to make art more accessible. I'm looking forward to the places that I'll be in in two years, for example, that I didn't anticipate being in because things have shifted in that way. And I hope that we can continue to focus inward on our skills and community and also to try to push for social revolution with this time that we've had to see things a little differently. And I've gone over time, I think. So thank you. Well, excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that. Um, I really like that sort of that uh, that conflict of the notion of time and care for the self at home and then, you know, social activism going out there and really championing um, these causes for uh, for indigenous rights, for LGBTQ plus rights. Uh, and uh, I think it's, you know, obviously, I think we're all here because we are uh, hopefully really all invested in, in that. Um, our final artist presenter for uh, this evening's program, and I'll fill in, we'll say, for public studio. Um, but our final presenter for the evening, uh, Vanier Scholar, a visual artist, an activist, a curator, and an educator who uses painting, installation, and performance to explore social justice frameworks and black activist culture. 
He's shown widely in galleries and festivals across Canada. He is a core team member of Black Lives Matter, so has been extremely busy uh, these past few weeks. I will say, unfortunately, busy these last few weeks. Please welcome to our screens, Cyrus Marcus Ware. Oh, muted. Right. So, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm actually in the part of Toronto that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase. So I'm on unceded territory, uh, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the territory that Chief Stacey Laform says is unceded. And uh, it's an honor to be coming to you from this, this territory and this land right now. Um, I'm going to try to uh, share my screen and come back and forth a bit just uh, to allow for the interpretation and for people to be able to read my lips. So uh, bear with me as I uh, attempt this technology. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, start by showing you this uh, quote that has really guided a lot of my practice. Whenever we try to envision a world without war, without violence, without prisons, without capitalism, we are engaging in speculative fiction all organizing a speculative fiction. Um, so I've been really thinking about that. It's not a beautiful idea that all activism is speculative fiction. Um, so all activism is speculative fiction. All activism is daring to dream that another world is possible. And as an artist, I've been really guided by that. I've been really you know, inspired by the possibility of daring to dream that another world was actually possible. Uh, you know, that Tony Cade Bambara quote that's been going around a lot now, it's actually the title of my, my PhD thesis, Irresistible Revolutions. You know, she says that the goal of the oppressed artist is to make revolution irresistible. And so that's been really driving my practice. And so speculative fiction is a big part of what I do because I'm daring to dream that another world is possible. Um, I started, um, let me share my screen again here. Um, I started uh, my practice uh, um, early in my practice writing love letters to activists, really trying to support and reach out to people who are on the front lines, who are doing the work, who are doing the labor of organizing, and who often bear the brunt of the stress and the the you know the the what it means to be so public as an activist in this current moment. Um, and so I started writing love letters to them as a way of trying to ensure their survival. And then I started drawing portraits of them. I started drawing giant portraits of activists, larger than life, um, as a way of celebrating and honoring um, their labor, their their organizing, their brilliance. And these images are, are huge. I mean, they're, they're this as you can kind of see it as a scale here. Um, this is Queen Titi Opelecki, just to give you a sense of scale for the drawing. Um, and these portraits were an act of reverence. You know, they were a way of kind of interrupting um, an art historical canon that only pa painted pictures and portraits of, of rich people, of white people, of cis people, of able-bodied people, of, of, of non-queer people, of straight people. You know, it's, it just, you know, and on, on and on. So I tried to interrupt that by drawing uh, portraits of people who I felt really were deserving of our attention, our admiration, our, uh, our love, and that was, um, you know, these activists. One of the portraits that I drew in 2015 um, was this one. And um, this uh, portrait uh, was drawn of a, a, an activist in, um, in Minnesota who had been partaking in an Eric Garner related Black Lives Matter protest and had uh, worn a mask that said, I can't, I can't breathe, which was Eric Garner's famous last words. And I drew that portrait because I was so uh, in awe, like just so in awe of this black activist in of all places, Minnesota, you know, taking over the Mall of America, which they ended up doing and doing this massive demonstration. Um, and then I, you know, sort of, we use masks and activism all the time to hide our identities, to protect us, sometimes to keep us safe from tear, tear gas. We soak them in vinegar and stuff, and we, we, we use masks all the time in activism. So it's not unusual that this person was in a mask. But now, after COVID, I pulled this drawing out again. You know, I pulled this drawing out again. It's huge. It's 12 feet tall. Uh, I pulled it out and looked at it again because, of course, now suddenly it means something so different to see somebody in a mask and of course, then to have, you know, George Floyd be killed and once again to say, I can't breathe and it not matter. 
You know, that, that once again, we were in a situation where black lives didn't seem to matter. So I, I've been really thinking about these drawings while I've been living in this isolation and thinking about um, Octavia Butler and how she was able to sort of imagine a future that hadn't yet happened yet and how I've been so invested in speculative fiction as an activist practice and how this drawing in some way in 2015 imagined a future that hadn't happened yet, this future in the now where we literally are writing it on our masks because we have to wear masks everywhere that we go. Um, I also uh, started writing speculative fiction recently. I wrote a play and uh, made an installation that was about uh, Antarctica um, and was about this idea, this really real thing that there's been people sent to Antarctica to be born to stake a future land claim. So humans don't seem to be able to learn that colonization is never okay. Um, so I wrote this play about what would happen if those 11 people were actually sent back to Antarctica to set up future colonies and what that would actually look like. So working with Raven Wings, with Yusuf Kadura, with Dainty Smith, um, you know, we were able to create this play and installation that talked about white supremacy, that talked about anti-blackness, that talked about trans issues, that talked about disability justice, that did all of that in this, you know, frame around climate change and around the world that we were hoping to get to. So there was a, a part play, a part installation. This was all created for the biennial. And there was a sister piece that I created with it that was called Ancestors Do You Read Us? And it was set in the future in 2078. And it sort of was a look back at the now and it was our ancestors, our sorry, our great, great grandchildren telling us, their ancestors, what we needed to do in order for them to get free. So overthrow capitalism, solve climate change, you know, er er eradicate systemic racism. These were the things that they were employing us to do. And I had a chance during the quarantine, during COVID, to be able to rework this imagining and rewrite And so for Folda, I wrote a story that imagined uh, the, the moment right after the ancestors, uh, sorry, our great-grandchildren gave us this message. Uh, so it sort of picked up on this video and continued um, uh, what would happen, uh, what would happen in the now, I guess, in the sort of just immediately after COVID that we would need to do in order to make sure that our, our great grandchildren got to be free. Um, and then uh, lastly, I've been spending a lot of my time during uh, quarantine uh, doing activism. I mean, my artistic practice is inseparable from my activism and vice versa. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential and they go hand in hand. So I've been making activist posters. These are some of the ones that I've been making. I've been involved in a lot of large scale campaigns around defunding the police and around trying to address this ongoing violence of policing directed towards black and indigenous communities. And um, so I've been making uh, posters like you can see here. Um, and then we also uh, did a large scale um, uh, uh, a uh, mural that I designed um, that we did for Black Lives Matter, and I'm just going to really quickly show you it, and then uh, and then we can kind of get into discussion. Oh, there's my lamp. It's hard to listen, but listen, cause it's much harder living it than listening to the hardships, to the heart's condition, and condition the air when the air that conditions keep cool with more tears. Sometimes a clear the vision, not what I see. Been a long time coming to try to run and rock and reach a new peak so the youngest can finally summit, climbing high above and then climb from it. Up to the skies and know we stand in the corruption and deconstructing the lies. I've seen this country decline, try to keep discussions confined, highly their decide on the extract and try to undermine it. Damn, but I still believe in the truth. We're missing them to see. And the both were PKT in the suit. And when we got it, we're all tested. And the feeling is peaceful. We come back. We go back. That's the body. So that was uh, this thank you to Tribe Called Red and to Shad for lending us the music for that. But that was something that we created right in front of police headquarters as a massive mural with you know, over 80 people helping us, a whole bunch of artists, uh, including you know some of Canada's greatest, you know, coming out to help support Black Lives. So that's what I've been up to. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, that that uh, road mural, that street mural, was just amazing. Made wonderful headlines, and obviously, it is my deepest hope makes a real impact on people's hearts and minds. Um, so, sadly, our final presenters of the program, Public Studio, can't join us uh, today um, because of uh, an emergency that to which they had to attend. Um, but I am going to um, very quickly um, walk us through their presentation, um, if I can. Uh, uh, get through to share my screen. Uh, there we go. And share. So, um, so Public Studio has been working uh, on a project. Uh, they're, they're calling it the 10 by 10 pho Photography Project. And they're featuring 10 uh, lesbian writers you should know. Um, so uh, Public Studio, for those who don't know, uh, is the collective art practice of filmmaker Elle Flanders and architect Tamira Sawatsky. Uh, and so since 2009, they've been working under the banner of Public Studio, employing a diverse range of media, resulting in large-scale public artworks, films, immersive installations, lens-based works, and socially engaged projects. So um, with 10 lesbian writers you should know, um, they are looking to honor and celebrate the courage to be first. So I'm not really gonna be able to get into all the details about all of these uh, amazing um, lesbian writers, um, but please jot down their names. If you don't know them already, uh, look them up. Uh, I certainly will be looking up the few that I don't know. Um, so here we go. Uh, so here we see Beth Brandt, a poet and novelist born in Detroit, but her ancestral home was in the Tyendignaga, Tyendignaga uh, Mohawk First Nation. Uh, here we have uh, Makeda Silvera, who was a Jamaican Canadian novelist who started Sister Vision Press. And next is Jane Rule. Uh, this is an iconic photograph. Uh, she wrote <coughs> the novel Desert of the Heart in 1964, which caused her to become, in her own words, the only lesbian in Canada. Uh, because so few people were out and proud at that stage. We have Nicole Brassard, a Montreal poet who recently won the Griffin Poetry Prize for Lifetime Achievement in 2019. We have Marie-Claire Blaise, a Quebecois writer who has been living in Key West, Florida for the past many years. Um, came to prominence in 1959 with her first novel, La Belle Bête. Nalo Hopkinson, an award-winning science fiction writer, speaking of speculative fiction, a science fiction writer, the author of many novels that mix dystopic futures, West African magic, fantasy, horror, love, and race. We have Noreen Stevens, the author of The Chosen Family, a serial cartoon that ran from 1987 to 2004. Susan Cole, a Toronto-based writer, one of the co-founders of the lesbian organization of Toronto. And oh, uh, Trish Sala, a Toronto-based poet, now a professor at Queen's University in the Department of Gender Studies. And finally, Shani Mutu, one of Canada's acclaimed novelists, but is also a visual artist. So that, uh, that is a series that Public Studio has uh, produced. So I know we're running over time, literally have like a minute to go. So I'm gonna pitch out one question to all of the artists who have presented tonight. Um, and my question is in one line or even in one word, if you can, can art bring people together and how? 
who wants to be first? <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I love, um, uh, you know, but I guess Brendan opened it up, you know, you know, I, I absolutely miss um, um, the human connection. You know, that's where a lot of our things came through some festivals at parties and clubs where you see, you smell, you taste, you touch, you feel people. So um, all this lockdown and social distancing in that, that regard uh, is not working for me. And anyone else? I, th I think that the way um, that we that we do share information, like if you tend to be on social media or communicate with your friends a lot, um, I've seen for years with the kind of gathering that's a part of my art practice, like friends would notice that I'm picking flowers kind of on the regularly and stuffing them in a notebook, for example, and then bring me flowers. And a different kind of aspect of that is embodied in like, I received some porcupine quills and um, some beads from a friend today. The tobacco that I'm growing is from seeds that somebody else sent me with instructions. And I'm like making drawings to make my own instructions because I need more instructions than they gave me so maybe the next person does too so there is connection it's just like a different kind of connectivity yeah wow um yeah i was, I was gonna say that you know i obviously miss the physical um uh, but i love this moment this gathering this idea of coming together is still such an important critical mass uh we are disseminating information and we have to think about things in that you know speculative future you know as uh, we've, we've all kind of talked about but cyrus mentioned you know um imagining a new future a new possibility so we can be resilient so we can find uh continue our revolution and our fight uh, but coming here i'm so inspired and i'm so grateful for everyone for for being so generous and kind and it gives me hope and that's a big thing for me yeah i think you know arts and artists are essential to the changes that we want to see i mean artists literally paint pictures of the future. Like they literally tell, write stories about what could potentially happen and give us warnings and, and do all this amazing, brilliant work that is highly undervalued, to be honest, in, as, as, as what it is, this revolutionary work that is propelling us forward to be better to each other, to take care of each other, to stay strong together, to be connected to each other. Like this is what art does, right? And we we are experts at it as, as artists who are trying to fight for change. We are experts at bringing people together and having hard conversations and introducing complex the you know, who's talking about prison abolition in a boring two-hour lecture no thank you i'd much <laughs> rather see a three-minute video or, or or engage in a really thought-provoking blog article or something that kind of gets people going you know see a beautiful painting or see some of the incredible work like car springer and you know sandra brewster and all these people who are making work right now about abolition and, and about you know the, the need for a change in our society artists help us have really hard conversations in such beautiful ways and i I'm yep. so thankful for the arts. I'm so thankful that we get to be creative people in this moment. And I'm so thankful to be in this revolution with all of you. I mean, what a beautiful time to be alive. Awesome. And Anya, last word from you. Yes, I think art is the ultimate time traveler, time travel machine. Um, it, we make it, we unpack it. Uh, it's the thing that brings us together, looking back, looking forward, time traveler. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to Brendan, to Anya, to Paul, to Sherry, to Cyrus. Uh, good thoughts to Public Studio, who needs some thoughts. Um, the Black community, the Indigenous community, um, anyone, anyone suffering hate in any way, shape, or form. Thank you so much to Pride Toronto. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, until we are free. Woo! Let's keep working. Ow! Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Have a good evening, all. <laughs>